Good morning, good morning. <clears throat> How are you all doing this morning? I know I'm not supposed to ask that, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You know what, whether you're having a good week or a bad week, we are so thankful that you came here this morning to worship along with us. And like Dale says, we are on the countdown to uh, moving from the basement to upstairs once again. And so we are thankful for the way that that is all moving along. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke 13. And we're going to go verses 1 through 9. And as we get ready to dig into the Word of God here this morning, I will once again say that we're going to have some repetition here again this morning. And it's okay when we repeat ourselves because maybe if you're like me, sometimes I need to hear something over and over and over again before it really sinks in and changes the way I live. And so this morning we are going to take a look at some very sobering and harsh words from Jesus to the crowd and then by through it over time to us about what it means to follow him, what he wants us to know about following him. And so as we get ready to dig into that this morning, I'm just going to ask for you, I'm not asking you for you to shout it out because it could become awkward really quick, but uh, what in your mind is the worst sin or worst sins that people can commit? Like I said, I'm not looking for you guys to show anything out. I'm just taking a drink because I've been speaking in my office over and over again, and so my voice is almost gone already. And so, as we think about this idea of sin or sins, and we rank them in our minds, I want to tell you this is a natural thing for people to do. Throughout centuries, we, 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 we toy with what is the worst sin out there or what are the sins that are most going to affect each and every believer or each and every person on this earth. When I was in student ministry, we talked about sin quite often. Every few years, we'd come through and talk about sin and how it separated us from God, and we talk about what are the worst sins, and in junior high, you can throw around a lot of different things, and so uh, we won't get into all the ones that they named off, but we were ranking them, trying to figure out what is the worst sin out there. Even, even starting in the 6th century, uh, uh, Pope Gregory I uh, took a look at sin out there and said, what, what are the sins that most affect us as people? And um, he put out what is known as the seven deadly sins or the seven cardinal sins. And this was expanded upon in the 13th century by Thomas Aquinas, where the seven deadly sins are, if you don't know them, that will affect some of us, or if not all of us, over time, are pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, anger, and laziness. And so that's what he had as the seven deadly sins or the seven cardinal sins. He also has other names for them. I took the easier names for me to say. And so, again, sin affects us. Sin is something that we all try to figure out, okay, what do we do moving forward? What is the benchmark and how do we navigate life? Even in my younger years, I, I, I tried to figure out, okay, who do I want to be like? Who don't I want to be like? And growing up in my younger years, my, my, my father was not a believer until 2003, and so my dad was my benchmark of what not to do. And I know that sounds awkward for some of you, because some of you guys had a great relationship with your dad. You had a father who who showed you so much, but there were certain things in his life that he did wrong that I was like, if I, if I can keep from doing that, then I'm on a good path. And I think for a lot of us here, that's what we do. We, we look around at the people around us in our life and we say, as long as I'm not as bad as, then I'm a good person and I don't need a savior. Or then I'm a good person and, and, I, and I'm gonna make it to heaven because the good are gonna make it in. And so this morning, as, as we think about sin as we think about separation from God, as we think about what is sin, I, I want to challenge you and me this morning to say, whatever we believe sin is in our minds, let, let us let Jesus tell us what sin is. Let us let Jesus tell us about who's going to make it in, how we can make it in. Let Jesus be our benchmark, our standard of what is good and what is right. And let's not look at the people on our right and our left, our people in our workplace, the people at our school, the people in our community, and say, as long as I'm a little bit better then. No, let us hear what Jesus has to say to us here this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. And if you're looking for a cross-reference to this story in the Gospel of Luke, you're not going to find anything directly related to it. 
Both Matthew and Mark have a parable of a fig tree, but it's a little bit different. In that parable, Jesus curses the fig tree. And so this teaching that we're going to look at here this morning is unique to the gospel of Luke. However, the truth behind it isn't something that's unique to Luke only. You can find it echoed throughout the gospels and throughout the Bible. And so if you have your Bible, we are going to read together Luke 13, 1 through 9. All right, I got, I got to focus here because there's one word in here that I keep on saying wrong and then it goes downhill really quickly all the time. So, this is what it says. It says, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Shalom fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on the fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that this morning as we look into and look through your word, as we look into your word and what are you saying to the people of your time, what are you saying to most excellent Theophilus, but what are you saying to us today? I pray that the truth that is found in scriptures will speak to the time that you were teaching, but also will speak to us today. And I pray that this morning, like I always pray, help me to say what you want me to say, help me to forget what you want me to forget. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit is moving in this place. I thank you for leading us in worship as we worship you this morning through song. And I pray now that as your word goes out, you will challenge us. You will convict us. You will lead us. You will guide us. And where are things that are wrong in our lives, we will make them right with you as your spirit moves. And so we just thank you for today. I thank you for the people here. I thank you for those that will be watching this later online. I just pray that again, you will continue to show us what it means to follow you each and every day. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So this morning, I want to ask that question that I ask all the way through the series that helps me process the gospel of Luke, and it's simply, what does Luke want most excellent Theophilus? What does he want the people of the day? What does he want us to know by inserting this story into his teaching? And I think it's simply this. Jesus wants us to know. He definitely wants the people of the day to know that that sin is sin. That sin is sin. We have these people come up to Jesus and and they're getting ready to justify, you know what, how good they are. And Jesus is wanting them to know that, that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I know I know for us who, who have grown up in the church or you've gone through life kids and you're like, how can sin be sin? Even for the people in this crowd, they'd be like, you know what, a lot of them would be good Jewish followers. And they'd be like, did you not read Jesus Leviticus chapter 20 where it talks about all the sins that lead to death or lead to the death penalty? Like, what do you mean all sins are sins? And I think as we think about that, we need to just pause for a moment and separate a little bit about what sin is sin is and also punishment. Like, if we look at this severely on punishment... You know what, if you were to break a law here in Canada, and I'm not saying this because I'm a lawyer or I'm an RCMP officer or anything like that, I looked it up online, guess what? If you had theft under $5,000, if you did fraud, if you stole property, it doesn't have as severe punishment as, say, first degree murder. I just want you to know that. They're both wrongdoings, they're all wrongdoings, but they don't have the same punishment. Theft under 5,000, fraud, stolen property, the punishment in our judicial system is either $5,000 fine, six months in jail, maximum two years in jail. 
If you kill somebody, first degree murder, guess what? The punishment is minimum life, maximum life. They're, they're all wrongdoings, but, but the punishment is a little bit different. I know, I know for our lives, we, we were like, okay, but, but sin is sin. The wages of sin is death. Yes, that's true. That's true. But somewhere in our lives, we think, as long as I don't do the big sins, then I'm okay. As long as I don't murder, as long as I don't steal, if I just lie, then, then I'm okay. And what Jesus wants the people in the audience to know is like, no, you are all sinners and you all need a Savior. Just because you grew up as a good Jewish man or a good Jewish woman, just because you grew up in the church, you, know, no, you, you, you still have sinned. And no one is better. You all need to repent and come to me. You see, within the, within the Greek, the word for sin here is aromatia, which means guilt, failure, fault, and it simply means to miss the mark. And so as, as Jesus comes here and, and he calls people out on their sin, he, he's saying, you know what, many people miss the mark. All people miss the mark. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, actually said in this case, when talking about sin and talking about missing the mark, he took the human and he took sin and he compared them to an archer. When an archer is looking at a bullseye, every single time he misses the mark, he sins. And so for Jesus, as he talks to the people, he, he wants them to know that anything that misses the mark is sin, whether you believe you are good or you're bad, whether you believe it's small or it's big. And so these people come to Jesus, and I want you to just think about this, and they say to him, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them this question, and he's asking us this question, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way. And in verse four, he introduces them to the 18 who the tower fell on them in Siloam. And he, and he said, do you think they're more guilty than all others living in Jerusalem? You see, somewhere in our minds, we like to think, you know what? No, no, I'm a little bit better, so I'm gonna get by. I have a better lineage, so me and my family are gonna get by. I grew up in the church or I grew up in the synagogue, so I'm going to get by. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You need to recognize who I am. You need to recognize who I am. Do you think the Galileans were worse off than any other Galileans? Do you think those that the tower fell on were more guilty? No, all have sinned and fallen short. And so Jesus is looking at this crowd just like he looks at us and, and he says, do, do you see your sin? Do you see the small sin or the big sin? Will, will you come to me? Will you, you give your sin to me? Because you know what? Anything that misses the mark, anything that I say is good and evil, anything that I say is right um, or wrong, you know what? You want to do what is good. You want to do what is right. You don't want to miss the mark. And so Jesus starts to push back against this Jewish teaching, this Jewish thought that they're good enough, that they're going to make it on their own. That they're going to make it under the law. They're going to make it because they're just a little bit better than everybody else around them. And this wasn't just in this teaching that people thought that. If you flip over to the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John chapter 9, Jesus' own followers, they look at a man who was blind from birth, and they say to Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus responds, it's beautiful. He says, neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but this happened so that the word of God might be displayed in his life. And so Jesus pushes back. He says, you think you're good? You think you're a little bit more righteous? You know what? All have sinned. All have sinned. All have missed the mark. And so if you're here this morning and you're new, this might be your first time hearing it, but if, you, if you're here this morning, you, you've heard this many times because we talk about it over and over again because Jesus keeps on bringing it up. And so if you're here this morning and, and, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to challenge you today, even if you think you're good, even if you think you're a little bit better than that person at school or at work or in the community, you know, Jesus is saying, no, 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 all have sinned. All have sinned. All have missed the mark. And maybe you're here this morning and you know Jesus as Savior, you know him as Lord, but, but there's sin in your life. There's places where you keep on missing the mark. Ask Jesus for help. Ask Jesus to forgive you. Ask Jesus to free you. And so as we continue on and we think about this idea that sin is sin, that all have missed the mark, 
What does Luke want most excellent for the office? What does he want the people of the day? What does he want us to know by inserting this into his gospel? He wants us to know we need to repent or perish. I know those are some harsh words and we're like, I, I, I don't like the word repent. I don't like the idea that if we don't repent, we're going to perish. But, but Jesus is talking to a crowd of men who are trying to say, I got this. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. I got it all together. And they're trying to justify how good they are by looking at those who died in awful ways. Think about that for a moment. Like These guys are freaking out because why? These Galileans, they, they go up to offer sacrifice to God, so they enter the temple. And as they enter the temple and as they present their sacrifice to ask for forgiveness for their sins, for some reason they get slaughtered by Pilate and his men and, and their blood drips into the sacrifice. And so these people are like, these are bad, bad, bad people. And what Jesus is saying, you know what? All are bad, repent or perish. It doesn't matter who you are, repent or perish. Right? He, he brings that point home when, when he looks at his, his crowd that he's teaching and he says, I tell you the truth. Were these Galileans worse sinners? I tell you the truth. No, but unless you repent, he's not talking about anybody else, unless you repent, the people in the crowd, you too will perish. He brings up the 18 who the tower fell on them. He says, are they more guilty? Do they have more debt than anybody else? No. But unless you repent, you too will perish. You see, Jesus loves this crowd so much that as they try to justify how good they are, as we try to sometimes in front of God justify how good we are, right? Look what I did in your name. Look at the right choices that I've made. As, as we justify who we are, Jesus looks at them and says, no, no, no. All have fallen short of the glory of God and repent. I know repent is not a popular word. I've heard Christians, I've, I've read articles that say, you know what, in church we shouldn't use the word repent anymore because it's outdated. And I want to say this, Jesus uses it twice right here. At the start of Jesus' ministry, as he calls out Matthew, a.k.a. Levi, the tax collector, to come follow him, he, he goes to a party at, at Matthew's house. And the religious leaders, they come up to them and they say, what are, you, what are you doing eating with sinners and tax collectors? And you know what his response is? It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so this morning, let's not think repentance is a bad word. Repentance simply means turn from, turn to. Turn from your sin, turn from your desires, turn from what you say, what is right and wrong, and, and turn to Jesus. Embrace Jesus, allow Jesus to speak his life into you. Let him to tell you what is good what is right, the way that he wants you to live. Turn to him, or as it says in the Hebrews, return, Hebrew, not Hebrews, in the Hebrew, return to. The word repent means return to. Return to that relationship that you were created for. Because guess what? God created you all in his image and his likeness. And as the book of Ecclesiastes tells us, there's a God-shaped hole in each one of us. And nothing in this world is going to satisfy us. Only God can, only Jesus can. And so we need to return to that relationship that Adam and Eve were created for in the Garden of Eden. That relationship where they walked with God, they talked with God. And so this morning, if you're hearing this for the first time, or the fifth time, or the tenth time, I wanna, I wanna tell you that there's a God that loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And we see the whole picture as Jesus teaches here in Luke 13. He has not yet went to the cross, but he's going to go to the cross. He's going to die in their place, in our place, and he's going to rise again. Forgiving them of sin. Forgiving them of their guilt, of their failure, of their fault, of their waywardness. Helping them when they place their trust in him, not to miss the mark anymore, but to find him. In John 10.10, 10, we say this often here because it's a part of who we are, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you have life, may have life and life to the full. That's what Jesus says. And so this morning, if, if you're here and you know Jesus as Savior and Lord, and there's still some sin going on in your life because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is affected by, by, by sin. We, we see the effects all around us. 
But if you're living this world right now, and as the thief comes along only to kill, steal, and destroy your life, not to give you life, but there's sin going on in your life, I want, I want to challenge you to confess it to God, to give it to Jesus, to lay it at his feet. You are saved, right? If you're a child of God, you are saved through de- Jesus' death and resurrection, and he has now given you his Holy Spirit to help you overcome, to help you live victorious lives. And so as Galatians 16 to 26 says, and I'm just going to paraphrase it, our freedom that we have in Christ is that, that, that he has given us his spirit to indwell in us so that we do not have to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The old is gone, the new is here. We can live by the spirit. We can have his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control evident in our lives so that we can overcome and so Jesus, he's, he's looking at this crowd that's coming along, and maybe you have people in your life that you know that say, I don't need Jesus, I'm good enough by myself. I, I don't know, need Jesus because, because you know what, I, I, I do a lot of good things, I give to charity, I help out at local things. I, I don't need Jesus, but I, I want you to know as Jesus looks at this crowd, he looks at us and he says, you know what, I need you to know sin is sin, sin has separated you, now come and repent. Come and repent. You all need to repent, otherwise you're going to perish. And those are some sobering words. Nobody wants to talk about perishing, but he's like, you need to repent or you will perish. Uh, one day you will be separated from me. And we'll read into that a little bit more as we, as we go through the parable in the next few moments. So this morning, Jesus wants us to know, you know what? Sin is sin. We need to repent. And then he goes into this teaching on the parable of the fig tree. What does Luke want, most excellent Theophilus? What does he want us to know? What does he want the people of the day to know by inserting this into his gospel? And I think he has a word for the people of his day, and he has a word for us, but they both ring true. And so in verse 6, it starts out, and he says, He told this parable, a man had a fig tree. He planted it in his vineyard, and he went to look, to fru- went to for f- and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. We'll pause there. You see, what I believe as we read that first verse there is that, that God wants to see fruit in his image bearers. Whether it was the Jewish people of the day, God wants to see fruit. And as Jesus is teaching and these people are following him, he wants them to bear fruit. They, he wants them to realize who he is, that he is not just a good moral teacher, but he is the Messiah that has come to save them. We know at least 12 of them get it because we have the 12 apostles that will go out and help change the world. We also have Jesus' brothers that might be in the crowd that they get it, that one day they say that their brother is God in the flesh who came to save us as Messiah. But as Jesus looks at this group of people, he says, do you, do you know who I am? If you are my people, if you are my followers, you're, you're going to bear fruit, you're going to look like me. I know we cheat because we, we have the whole story. We know about Jesus' life, his, well, his birth, his life, his ministry. We know about his death and his resurrection. We know that one day he's going to return. And so for us, it's like, okay, it's a little bit easier to understand who he is. But for the people of the day, you've got to remember, there were many in that crowd, and I've said it before, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, that, that they knew the prophecies surrounding Jesus. They knew what the Old Testament said about where he would be born, about what his ministry would look like, eventually what his death and resurrection would look like. According to one conservative scholar, they said that there's 456 verses that talk about Jesus' advent, both his first and second. I believe that there's more than that, but he says 456 about Jesus' advent, and he said that in Jesus' life, he fulfilled 300 of those. In his life, death, and resurrection. And so Jesus is standing before these Jewish people. There's also Gentile people wrapped in that crowd, but he's saying, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And if you want to be my followers, guess what, you want, guess what I want from you? I want you to bear fruit. I want you to look like me. Not just dead, not just producing nothing, but, but alive and producing the fruit that I'm about to give you. The fruit that I'll help you with through my Holy Spirit. In John 15, 1 through 17, Jesus is teaching his disciples about him being the vine and us being the branches. 
And he says this, and this is something that we need to take in here today. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is who he says you are. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus wants us to know that. He wants the people of the day to know that, that if you are calling yourselves a follower of him, you must bear fruit. And we see in the early church, after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, we see Peter, James, John, all these disciples, all these apostles go out and they're bearing fruit. They're more, looking more and more like Jesus. And I want to ask you to ask yourself, are we? Each and every day, are we looking more and more like Jesus? Because he wants his fig trees, he wants his plants to bear fruit. The second thing, as we look into the parable of the fig tree, I, I think we need to know this, that, that God is patient, but his opportunities will not last forever. In verse 7, it continues on and it says, So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, this is the owner, he says, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? It's a sobering truth to hear that in this parable, the, the, the owner of the fig tree says, you know what, I want you to cut it down. I want you to cut it down. And we're like, well, Jesus, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I know for many people that read into this, for theologians that read into this, some of them say this is just specifically to the Jewish people that is talking about the war that's going to come in, in 70 AD where Jerusalem is going to be overthrown and they're going to be cut down. But I think the truth here to the Jewish people of that day and us is that, that we're all going to have to give an account one day. I know some of us, when we, when we read into this, this, this verse, and we hear about the owner going there for three years to look for figs and haven't found any, some of us might think, oh, Jesus is talking about his ministry, right? We, we know according to scripture that Jesus' ministry was probably around three years, but I don't think that's what Luke is talking about here. Even though we are, we are given by Luke that Jesus started his ministry at 30 years old, we learn from, the, from John's writing that he was around for three Passovers, and so his ministry was about three years. I, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think, I think what Jesus is simply talking about for the people of the day and for us is that there is ample opportunity for us to make things right with God. But one day that opportunity will come to an end. You see, all those that were around in the time of Jesus that died, that didn't make it right with Jesus, you know what, they missed their opportunity. For us, as, as we're here today and we're breathing air, if, if we are not right with God, one day we will miss our opportunity because one day it'll all be over and as he says those words, cut it down, I know it's a very sobering image of this tree being cut down, but one day there will be a final judgment. We've talked about this before, so I don't want to spend lots of time on it, but, but hell is a real place. Eternity is forever, and it's going to be hot, right? Separation from God is, isn't something funny to talk about, something lighthearted to talk about, so most people don't talk about it. But God is patient, and he's giving us opportunity to repent. He's giving us opportunity to come into a relationship with him, but one day that opportunity will come to an end. One day we will be separated. And remember when I said hell is not for us. Hell was created for Satan and his followers. But we need to know that, that one day there will be no more opportunity. Either when we breathe our last breath here on this side of eternity or when Jesus shows up, the time will be up. And so I want, I want to challenge you, I want to challenge me to think about, think about where are we at with God? Do we keep on pushing off till tomorrow what we can make right today? Because God is patient. But the opportunity will not last forever. And if you know this to be true, I, I want to challenge you to allow that to sink into your head, into your heart, and transform the way that you live because I don't know about you, but I don't want my friends, my loved ones, those around me to be separated because the opportunity will not last forever. As we, as we read this parable, I want to just say one more thing. Is that as God the Father is patient, is patient and his opportunity won't last forever, 
I want you to know this, God is merciful to the end. In this parable, the vine dresser or the gardener, he, he looks to the owner and he says, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, we can cut it down. God is merciful to the end. This, this vine dresser and this gardener, he, he looks at this fig tree that, that hasn't been producing, hasn't been producing, hasn't been producing, and he says, you know, just, just give me one more year. Give me one more year to, to work the soil around it, to break it up so that the water can get down into the roots. Give me time to put fertilizer on it. Give me time so that, so that, that it can bear fruit like you want it to, like you created it to. Don't, don't give up on it yet. And I want you to know God is merciful to the end. He is merciful to the end. You know how I know that? I, I know that in my life, I've been very rebellious against God many times throughout my life. And God never gave up on me. He kept on saying, Darren, no, I want you to produce fruit. I want you to produce fruit. Even when I was trying to run in the other direction, trying to do my own thing, he's like, no, I want you to produce fruit. Even in my grandpa's life, my, my mom told me that back in 2003, my, my grandpa got sick for the last time. And she, she went to visit him. And she was sitting down with him. And, and he was just fighting. He was just fighting. He was just fighting. Because all his life, he was fighting God. And on his deathbed, my mom, my mom just sat down with him and she said, hey. Well, she didn't say hey. She probably said it a different way. She's not, she doesn't talk like me. <laughs> but she, she, just, she presented the gospel to my grandpa. She talked about a God that loved him, that made him, made him for a purpose and had a plan for his life and how, how we've all sinned and fallen away. And she's like, and Jesus died for you and he rose again. Will, will you accept him as Savior and Lord? And my mom said that in that moment, my grandpa squeezed her hand so tightly. And she said after that, for the next few hours before he passed on, he was just at peace. You see, God is merciful to the end. And I know most of us want that story. I'm going to, not most of us, some of us want that story. I'm going to continue to rebel. I'm going to continue to rebel. And on my deathbed, I'm going to give my life to God. But, but why wait for tomorrow what you can do today? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And God doesn't want to just give you life in eternity. He wants to give you full life now. And so, I want to say to you here this morning, God is merciful to the end. Repent and follow him. Bear fruit, produce crop, because he wants you to be his masterpiece. He wants to breathe life into you so that you can reach out and be a part of his kingdom work right now. And so if there's people in your life here this morning that are far off from God, that don't know God, don't write them off. Continue to meet them where they're at. Continue to pray for them. Continue to show them who Jesus is and what he has done in your life. Continue to share Jesus with them and give them an opportunity to know him, to repent and to follow. Again, I'm gonna read this verse one more time, even though I read it many times over the last few sermons. 2 Peter 3, 9 comes to mind when it talks about the return of Jesus Christ. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so this morning, church, if you know this to be true, if you, if you know Jesus as Savior and Lord, continue to walk victorious in him. If you know Jesus as Savior and Lord and there's some sin going on in your life that you need to make right with him, make right with him today. Don't push it off till tomorrow. And if you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I want you to, I want you to know that he wants you to repent and come to him. He wants to give you life and life to the fullest. And we know that the word of God says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I challenge you to do that today. And so this morning, I'm gonna invite the worship team back forward. And as they come forward, I just wanna give us some things that we can do to make this practical this week. Again, these aren't half the do's. These are just things that you can do if you wanna dig in a little bit more and say, God, okay, what do you want me to process this week? And the first thing I want to challenge you and me to do is, is say, Holy Spirit, show me in my life if there's any sin that we need to make right. And if he does, give it to him. The second thing I want you to know is that repent is not a bad word. Right? Repent, turn from, turn to, return to. And so as we continue to talk about Jesus and who, who he is and what he's done in our lives, let's, let's offer to the people around us, uh, you know what? A time to repent. 
Third thing, um, I want to challenge you and I want to challenge myself too. Take some time this week with God. Take some time with the Holy Spirit and say, where am I seeing growth in my life? Because I want to be a tree that's producing fruit. Again, we can't produce the fruit ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives each and every day. We need God in our life each and every day. You're not just going to will production. We need, we need God in our lives. So ask yourself, you know what, where in my life am I seeing growth? And lastly, this one really hit home for me and maybe God just put it on my heart just for myself here today, but ask yourself where you have seen God's mercy and patience lately in your life. And as you, as you recognize where you've seen God's mercy, God's patience in your life lately, extend that same mercy and patience to those around you. Again, I'm going to just remind you, as mentioned earlier, you have, if you have people in your life that, that have questions about God, invite them to Alpha starting February 7th. And in a few moments, we're going to sing Refiner's Fire. And we're going to say, God... Refine our, refine our fire. It's my heart's one desire to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. And as we sing that, I, I pray that that will be something that's true that we are singing. If we don't mean it, let's not sing it. Let's not just mouth the word, but let's mean the words. And so let's sing that out together. And also, if you need prayer, we have a prayer team at the back that would love to pray with you. Prayer doesn't show weakness. Prayer just shows that we're all in this together. And so let me pray for you and pray for myself as well. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for who you are and what you are doing. Um, God, I, I know there's a lot of stuff that I forgot to say that I wrote down, but God, you know what you're doing. Your word is like a double-edged sword. It, it penetrates bone and marrow. And so I pray that as your word goes out here this morning, as it, as it convicts our hearts, as your Holy Spirit moves, change will happen. And it won't happen because we're forced to do it, but we will come willingly and say, Jesus, I need you. And I'm so tired of trying to do this on my own. I need to receive your forgiveness, and I thank you that you died on the cross in my place. And I believe not only that you died on the cross, but you rose again, and I thank you for that. And as we receive you as Savior and Lord, and for everyone here that received you as Savior and Lord, let us thank you for the Holy Spirit who is at work in our lives, making us more and more like you filling us with your fruit. And God, I pray right now that wherever someone is hurting, wherever someone is far off, wherever somebody is sinning and missing the mark, that they will say, Holy Spirit, work in my life. Make me more like you. Help me not just to be a Christian by what I say, but help it to be also my actions follow up with my words. And so God, I pray that this morning you will continue to transform us, that you will continue to make us more, look more like you and that here at River of Life Church and in all your churches around the world, we will bear fruit that will encourage us to continue to go out and, and be who you've called us to be in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our communities. People that are, that are pointing to you, the place where people can find life and let them fall. We just thank you for what you're doing here today. In your name we pray. Amen.